Hello everyone. Today we are going to play a little bit. So I'm starting by presenting a Nash Equilibrium, which is a solution concept. So probably the, the most famous solution concept in game theory. A, a solution concept um, tells you what players will play, what rational players will play in a game. So, and the Nash equilibrium tells you that uh, given uh, what the other play, each player will play their best response. So the move that maximizes their expected utility given what the other play. So said differently, they have no interest, no one has any interest to deviate from the equilibrium given that the other remain, uh, like st keep, keep playing as in the equilibrium. So let's start with an example. Um, so actually, so today I, I will make you play directly um, using this website. So, oh, how can I show? Yeah, so sly.do slash 556.556, so you can go there. Um, I'll put it for the chat. There will be uh, three of them. The, the next one will be this one, and the next one, this one. But the first one is a 556, 556. Yeah. And, oh no. Sorry, that's not the right one. Do you, do you, when you arrive on the page, you, you see this one, fair or, or unfair? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not the right one. Uh, why, why not? Maybe I should do that. Uh, okay, no, because this is... Okay, no, yeah, sorry, this one. Yeah, of course. Okay, and now if you refresh the page, you, you see that, right? Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the example. So it's a coalition game. So say you are uh, on a date and uh, it's time to order and uh, you have two choices, beer or tea. Uh, because it's a coordination game, uh, you prefer you have a preference for taking the, this, ordering the same as the other one. And uh, let's say that uh, every, like the both, people order simultaneously. Uh, you can make a story of how this could happen, it's not uh, really the matter. And, uh, and so you have uh, the following payoffs. So uh, if both order T, it's the, it's the best uh, outcome uh, for everyone because uh, it's healthy and uh, you have the, the same uh, drink as the other one. Uh, then, uh, if uh, both choose beer, uh, you're also happy to, to have taken the, the same choice as the other, but it's less healthy, so each one gets only one. And uh, if one gets beer and the other gets tea, then uh, the, the one with beer can, uh, can, can show off and it's like the, the cool guy, so they obtain two and the other only zero. So, so in this game, what do you play? So you don't, you shouldn't be, um, so you can, you can choose on your phone and you shouldn't be influenced by uh, your, your true preferences for beer or tea. Just imagine that your payoffs are like that. So what you will gain or lose will depend on the others, what the other will play. Yeah, 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 so yeah, that's why it is better. But okay, but uh, I mean, this is just just assume the payoff matrix is like that. So, uh, so, so yeah, this is the rule of the game somehow. So yeah, of course, uh, maybe it's not realistic, but uh, yes, yes, yeah. Have you answered, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Let me answer two and uh, let's see. So everyone plays T apparently. Oh no, 
29, okay. This is because, uh, okay, so, so uh, two thirds play T and one third play BR. So, he, okay, it's, it's too late to play now, but, uh, but yeah. So, uh, so we see that, uh, <laughs> so, so we see that, uh, the, I mean, we failed because we, we failed to coordinate. It was a coordination game and, uh, and half played beer, half played tea. So, uh, so basically uh, half get zero, half get two. Uh, we could have done better. We could have done uh, T, uh, all of us, and we would have all the uh, one, two. Um, this is an illustration that uh, people do not always play the Nash equilibrium. And, and indeed, in this game, okay, what are the, is there a Nash equilibrium in this game? Yes? Yes? Exactly. Exactly, yes. So in this game, there are two Nash equilibria. So as you say, either both choose beer, in which case um, you don't have an interest to, to deviate because then you get zero instead of one, or both choose T, and in which case if you deviate and, uh, and choose beer instead, then you also get two. So you can, but it, it's not an improvement. So, uh, so, so these two um, uh, outcomes are Nash equilibria, and, uh, and the other ones, uh, we can show that they are not Nash equilibria. So, um, yes, so um, in this game, the, the Nash equilibria are in pure strategies, meaning that uh, people choose a given action but Nash equilibria can, in principle, also be in mixed strategies. So mixed strategy, it means that you randomize. So you flip a coin in your head, and uh, depending on whether it's head or tail, you choose beer or tea, for example. So this can, is a potential uh, strategy, and, uh, and Nash equilibria can, uh, can, can, imply, uh, can be with uh, such mixed strategies. And in case of uh, mixed strategy, there is an equality of payoff theorem that says that each player will be indifferent of any action uh, they, they can play. So in my example, it's a head, uh, I play beer, tail, I play tea. So it means that given what the other play, I am indifferent between playing beer or tea. So I flip a coin. And uh, it's important that I flip a coin and I do not choose like one instead of the other because the other player rely on the fact that I will mix. And the reason why I am indifferent between uh, beer and tea, it's, it's probably because other players are mixing. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, so this is why it's uh, important in the notion of equilibrium. So in the first game I presented, there is no um, equilibria, the equilibrium that involves mixed strategy. Um, but is it the case uh, in the second game? So the second game is a game of, of chicken, where uh, you have like a two, uh, so, so imagine in this game you are, you are a bit stupid, you, so um, you, you say, yeah, originally the game is like um, two person, each one in a car, and uh, they, they drive uh, really fast uh, against uh, the other car. And uh, if, they, if they don't deviate, then they crash and they die. Uh, and uh, if someone deviates just before they would crash, then uh, this one is a chicken. And, uh, and so like they, they, yeah, they, are, they lose because uh, they are not bold enough. Um, with the with the date uh, metaphor, you can imagine that uh, like daring is uh, is uh, proposing uh, to have uh, shots of vodka, and uh, chicken is uh, saying no, no, not tonight. Uh, I have to work tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, both players are better off uh, mm -hmm. if if they I mean they do the same thing. They are better off by not uh, accepting the shots, but the one who proposes, if the other refuses. Uh, again, they win because they are the, the cool guy. So, um, so what would you play in this case? Would you, 
would you um, yeah would you dare chicken or flip a coin to decide Yeah, so the payoffs are like that. So um, again, if, if you dare and the other chicken, you, you win five. So it's the best. Uh, otherwise, if you chicken and uh, the other chicken, you win four. If you chicken, the other dares, you win one. And if both dare, everyone has zero. So, um, so two third uh, chicken and 20% uh, flip a coin. So it's not too bad because, uh, okay, sorry, th there is one uh, who dares, probably this one is uh, the big winner, but, uh, but uh, if we had played uh, with just two of us, we'd probably had, have uh, chosen uh, chicken and chicken, which is not a Nash equilibrium, actually, because if, I know that you will chicken, I will dare. So again, it's an illustration. So I, don't, I have no interest to remain in this, uh, in this uh, strategy profile. So again, it's, a, it's an example to show that people do not always play the Nash equilibrium. So what are the, the Nash equilibria of this game? Or can someone name at least one Nash equilibrium? Yes. Then if, if the other one takes, for example, there, and, and I have to decide, then I would stick to the chicken because there would be one less, and for the other person, um, also, JG would be one less. Yes, exactly. So uh, if I know you will dare, uh, then the best response to me is uh, to chicken, otherwise, we both die. Um, and vice versa. If you know I will chicken, then you should dare. Uh, your best response is to dare. Uh, yes? Uh, I just have a question about the numbers. Um, why is it five and one and not also two and three? It's because uh, with this set of number, there is uh, another uh, equilibrium. Uh, that, uh, that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going, uh, so can you see an, a third uh, possible Nash equilibrium? This one is tricky. It's the mixed strategy. And so it works because I have chosen these numbers. So I've, I'm denoting it one half, one half. So in this case, uh, you flip a coin between uh, dare and, both player flip a coin between dare and chicken. And so let's, let's imagine uh, we are player one and player two will play there with probability one half and chicken with probability one half. Okay, let's say um, we play there. Then it means that with probability one half we have zero. With probability one half we have five. So uh, in expectancy we have three. And uh, imagine we play chicken with probability one half we have one. With probability one half we have four. And, uh, sorry, it was 2.5, the, 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 the average, not the three. And, uh, and so with uh, in expectancy, we also have 2.5. So we are indifferent between the two options. Uh, so any uh, between dare or chicken would be a best response. And uh, symmetrically, uh, the other player two, uh, they will be indifferent when we play dare or chicken with probability one half. So when both play dare or chicken with probability one half, um, the, other, uh, the other strategy is the best response. So this is a Nash equilibrium. And um, now we can um, understand that there can be multiple Nash equilibria for a, a given game. 
and some Nashi Kruberia are better than others. In the Cordish Nation game, the Nash equilibria, equilibrium uh, where both drink tea is better than the Nash equilibrium where both drink beer. And uh, in the second one, there is one Nash equilibrium which is the best for player one. It's when player one dares and player two is chicken. Vice versa, there is one Nash equilibrium which is better for player two. And uh, there is one Nash equilibrium which is um, better um, for uh, welfare. So, uh, so in expectation, if uh, in the Nash equilibria where uh, one dares and one chicken, one player will get one and one player will get five. So on average, player will get three. And uh, the Nash equilibrium where uh, everyone mixes, then uh, will probability one fourth, you will get there, there, zero. Win probability one fourth, chicken, chicken, a uh, chicken there, so three three, and with probability four, uh, four um, for each. So this is uh, four plus uh, three plus three plus zero, so it's 10 divided by four, 2.5. So, um, so for welfare, actually, this is, it depends how you compute welfare. But if uh, you are interested in the minimum that, uh, that the players will, that each player will get, uh, is better because it will be a 2.5 on expectation while uh, it will be one if one dares and one chicken. But if you are interested in the, um, in the sum of what player gets, the, the, uh, the average, then it's better to have uh, the unequal uh, Nash equilibrium. Uh, so to find the Nash equilibria in, uh, in, uh, in a given game, in a, uh, general game, it's quite tricky because one needs to check all possible combinations of actions played with pro positive probability and uh, so the complexity is uh, um, NP complete so it's, it's uh, very computationally uh, demanding. In, uh, so, so of course it's John Nash who introduced uh, the concept of uh, Nash equilibrium in his uh, PhD thesis, his PhD dissertation was only 28 pages. So it was such a, like a breakthrough uh, to, to, to invent a Nash equilibrium that uh, yeah, he was done with uh, less than 30 pages. And uh, in, this, uh, in this paper, now it's a paper which is called Non-Cooperative Games, he proved the existence of a Nash equilibrium for any game, any finite game with a finite number of, uh, of players and, and moves. So um, it means that whatever the game, there is at least one Nash equilibrium and the proof relies on a fixed point theorem, just as uh, all the proofs of existence in, uh, in game theory. And, uh, and Nash uh, was a mathematician uh, and uh, made also important contribution to math and won the, won the Abel Prize for, for this, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. He had a, a strange life because he was um, a schizophrenic and, uh, and so for 30 years he, he couldn't, uh, I mean, he, he's done all of his uh, important research before 30 because after that he was uh, uh, occupied by uh, his, his disease. Any question on the Nash equilibrium? Yes? What happens when you have a one after the other sequential? So it's a good transition for the good transition for the next slide, actually. Uh, no, for okay. For the next uh, next the next some next slides. Um, yeah, there is an appropriate notion of equilibrium, but we'll come to that. Any other question? Yes? Um, NP means um, non uh, non. Uh, I don't remember the, the what it stands for, but basically it's um, it's uh, it comes from computer science. Uh, it's uh, it's a measure of the complexity of a problem in terms of uh, the time of computation, 
And so you have uh, polynomial problems uh, that uh, if it's a problem of size n, where n in this case it would be uh, the number of, of players, for example, or the number of, of moves, then you can solve the problem in uh, a time that is uh, proportional to the polynomial, a polynomial in n. So, for example, n to the power of 5. And um, when it's uh, np, it's because uh, once you know the answer, you can verify it in polynomial time. But to, to know the answer, uh, we don't know any algorithm that uh, allows you to, to know it in a polynomial time. So it's, it, it will be much longer to, to compute. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's so, so complex that as soon as your game is a bit, uh, uh, as soon as n is above, I don't know, 20, 50, uh, like normal computers cannot do it. Um, and complete, uh, it's a subclass of, uh, of NP, uh, which says that um, uh, that um, what does it say? That it's really, and I, I'm not able to say, but uh, right now I can tell you at the pause. But that it's really uh, complex, basically. You're welcome. It's not really important uh, for for the lecture. For, for economists. Um, now, uh, another Nobel Prize, Robert Aumann, proposed a generalization of Nash equilibrium, which is called the correlated equilibrium. And he argued that this notion is more appropriate than the Nash equilibrium as a solution concept. Um, so it, it, it works as follow. You have a third party, which is trusted by, by both players, uh, that we can call nature, that suggests an action to each player. Then player know, I mean, they, they do not know the action that are suggested to the others, but they know from which distribution of um, strategies the nature has drawn the, uh, their, suggest their suggestion. And so they, um, they, they have subjective probabilities about what the others will do, given this information. So um, in this, uh, and, and yeah, and there is a correlated equilibrium when it's in the in player's best interest to follow the suggestion. So let's understand it with the game of chicken. So there are several uh, best uh, correlated equilibrium. Actually, it can be shown that any convex combination of Nash equilibria is a correlated equilibrium. And the best one is this one. So with probability one third, nature will suggest player one to dare and player two to chicken. With probability one third, nature is, will suggest uh, player one to chicken and player two to dare, and with probability one third, nature will suggest both player to chicken. Um, let's compute the, the welfare for this um, correlated equilibrium if, uh, if players play according to it. It means that with probability one third, we'll have uh, uh, three on average, with probability one third, we'll have three on average, and with probability one third, we'll have four. So, which is uh, four plus three plus three, ten divided by three. So, three point three, three three on average, which is higher than uh, the the best um, Nash equilibria, which just gave uh, three on average. So, um, so not only we get a higher uh, expected payoff for uh, the average player, but we also get an, a better expected payoff for the, the player with the minimum payoff. So uh, if the two players play this correlated equilibrium, they are better off than, uh, than playing, uh, say, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So it's, it's, it's a bit... Um, abstract this notion of uh, receiving a suggestion from nature. What does it mean? Like, uh, but we can check 
that if you actually receive the suggestion to play there, this is the only thing you, you know. Like you receive the suggestion to play uh, what you have to play, but you don't know what the other player received. But if you receive the suggestion to play there, and you know you are in this created equilibrium, then the only possibility is that the other player has received the suggestion to chicken. Because the other uh, possible suggestion on is the it suggests you to chicken. Oh. Um, yeah, I hope. Uh, please tell me in the Zoom if. Uh, yeah, I will check because next time I had this, there was a problem in Zoom. Um, okay. So if you receive the suggestion to chicken to dare, then it means that the other will chicken. So uh, if they play by the equilibrium. So indeed, uh, your best uh, response is to dare. Now, if you receive the, su the suggestion to chicken, it means that you are either in this case or in this case. So with probability one half, the other player has received the suggestion to dare, and with probability one half, to chicken. And as we've seen, when the player, the other player, chickens or dare with the probability one half, then uh, any move uh, is uh, is the best response. So uh, chicken is a possible best response. So you can uh, again uh, abide by the, the suggestion. So now, what does it really mean? I mean, does it have a sense, uh, this notion of correlated equilibrium, when there is no third party to give suggestions to player? We see that, uh, yes, because um, an equivalent um, representation of this correlated equilibrium is that each player has some partial information about what the other will do and what the other know. So they have some partial informations, including about what the others know about what we are doing. So, um, yeah, under the assumption that it is common knowledge that everyone maximizes their expected payoff, that everyone is rational. So, um, in this, uh, in this example, the idea is that um, you may have the belief that the other will chicken. And in this case, it's in your best interest to dare. You may also have the belief that with probability one half, the, the other one will dare, and with probability one half, they will chicken. And it's, in this case, it is in your best interest to chicken. And what the best created equilibrium says is that with probability one third, you will hold the first belief, and with probability two third, you will hold the second belief. And uh, symmetrically for the other players. And so each um, uh, correlated equilibrium is the um, result, the optimal result. Uh, of uh, the, the optimal strategies of the players given some information structure, some information set. So uh, in this case, what is the information set? It's like with probability one third, you have the belief that uh, the other will chicken, with probability two third, that uh, they play the mixed strategy. This is an information set. This is one possible information set. And uh, if all players have this information set, then their best uh, thing to play is this uh, corrected equilibrium. And vice versa, to each corrected equilibrium corresponds uh, an information set uh, that will uh, imply that uh, players who, who have beliefs uh, according to this information set will play the corrected equilibrium. Is there any question? Because it's a bit... Uh, hard to understand this notion. No? Okay, so um, it, it is more general than uh, Nash equilibrium because um, every Nash equilibrium is a correlated equilibrium 
and it is the correlated equilibrium where um, the suggestions are not correlated, meaning that in mixed strategy, you you don't um, you play the mixed strategy whatever the the other players uh, will do, and uh, what you will play there or chicken is not correlated to what the other player will do. Um, What else to say? Um, that um, so in Nash uh, equilibrium, there is um, something that that, uh, that can be criticized. That is criticized by Robert Aumann, is that we suppose that the players know what the other player will do, and what they choose is the best response to what the other player will do. But why would a player know for sure what the others will do? In the correlated equilibrium, we relax this assumption and we just said that players have beliefs about what the others will do, but they are not necessarily sure of what the others will do. They can have beliefs uh, uh, that, that with probability one third they will play this, with probability two third they will play that. And uh, it's also weird in Nash equilibrium, the, 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 thing, the, the fact that people mix their strategy, that they flip a coin in their head before playing. Because this is not how people behave in practice. In practice, you, if you're indifferent between two uh, options, you will find a way to choose, like, uh, I don't know if you're indifferent between uh, dare or chicken, you will choose chicken because uh, just in case not to die, you know? And um, in the correlated equilibrium, people don't mix, actually. They, they choose, they, they, they apply the suggestion by nature, or in the more uh, appealing interpretation, they choose the best uh, move given their beliefs. So this notion of correlated equilibrium, it's really an equilibrium between beliefs of players. Okay, and so the, the notion uh, of knowledge is important, and actually, notion of common knowledge, which was uh, also um, formalized by Robert Aumann. Common knowledge uh, is when uh, all players uh, know, um, okay, we have to say common knowledge of something. Uh, let's say common knowledge that uh, there is class uh, at, uh, at two next week. Okay, there is common knowledge between us because we all know that we all know that, and we all know that we all know that, and we all know that we all know that we all know that, etc. ad infinitum. This is uh, the definition of common knowledge, and it plays an important role in game theory. Uh, for the correlated equilibrium, the, where it plays a role is that it is common knowledge that every mo everyone is rational. So everyone knows that everyone is rational. Everyone knows that everyone knows that uh, everyone is rational, etc. And uh, and this notion of equilibrium has a tractable complexity. So here it's polynomial complexity p, uh, because you just have to solve this uh, system of uh, inequality. Um, so what it shows is that uh, so. P star are the, the suggestions by, uh, by nature. So uh, when J is a uh, dare and K is uh, chicken, then uh, pay uh, GK is one third, is the, the suggestion that uh, nature gives this suggestion. And uh, from our point of view, we are uh, player J. Uh, we will play J, so uh, we are player, I mean, I, and we will play J, we will play uh, dare, when um, it maximizes the, the expected utility, so uh, given what the other play, so they will play k with probability pjk, and uh, playing j as suggested will be above the expected payoff of anything else we could play, any other move d. 
Um, okay, so this is just uh, the math behind. You don't have to, to remember this, but, uh, but it's easy to compute. Yeah. Are there any questions on this notion of uh, quality equilibrium? Yes. Because um, you are indifferent between C and D. So uh, in Nash, uh, here in Nash, uh, the, you, you could play either C and D, but the only um, strategy that would be a Nash equilibrium is if you mix, if you play uh, C and D uh, with probability one half. Now, uh, if you pay um, C and D with uh, probability one half in this case, uh, we would have to check whether it is a correlated equilibrium or not. Uh, I cannot tell uh, right now. Maybe it is, because this is just one correlated equilibrium. There are others. Uh, and actually, this, this one where both players uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know that if, if you are sure that the other will, uh, if in all, whatever happens, you know that the, 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 your belief is that the other will play C with probability one half or D with probability one half, and you do the same, it is a Nash equilibrium, so it is also a correlated equilibrium. Here, we have another Nash equi uh, a correlated equilibrium, but it's not only uh, knowing that, uh, believing that the other will play uh, C with probability one half, D with probability one half, because you, you believe that just in two thirds of cases. But in one third of cases, you believe that the other will chicken. So, uh, so it's, uh, somehow you have like two, two layers of belief. You have uh, the, that uh, nature throw a coin, to make, and, and depending on the result, you will have uh, certain beliefs about the, what the, uh, the player will do. And everyone knows that uh, it works that way, that uh, nature throws coins, and uh, that uh, gives the, the beliefs of everyone. Maybe it's best understood as uh, something with like millions of people, and uh, you know that a certain fraction of people have certain belief, like one third of people think that the other will play chicken, and two thirds of people think, believe that the other will play the mixed strategy. Well, in this case, uh, it is uh, in the interest of those who uh, believe uh, that the other play chicken to play there, and in the interest of those who believe uh, the mix to play chicken, and, uh, and you will obtain this uh, equilibrium. Sorry? Because um, this is uh, because if if you think that uh, the other uh, will will um, will throw a coin, so it will be one half there, one half chicken. Then your best response, I mean, you are indifferent between dare or chicken. You agree? We've seen that. Uh, and uh, if you play uh, chicken, then uh, the other will have no interest to deviate. You will be in a situation of equilibrium. So, so yeah. Is it, is it clearer? Uh, okay, but um, yeah, but um, the the thing is that uh, if you if you play uh, there. Um, then you are uh, deviating, 
and, uh, and the other player is not rational to think that you will play chicken. So, um, also what is important is that you're indifferent between dairy and chicken. So, you could play dairy in theory, but this would not be an equilibrium strategy. Because if the other player knew that you would play dairy, the other player would know that you are not playing according to the equilibrium, so something else would happen. But as we've seen, people do not always play uh, following an equilibrium. So, okay. Um, our man um, had made, uh, made also uh, other important contributions with Hans Comb. They they address the question of what happens when we have to take decisions under uncertainty. Uncertainty in, is the situation where we do not know the probabilities. So there are two kinds of, uh, of, uh, of way of dealing with uh, probabilities. Or it's uh, risk and uncertainty. With risk, we know exactly the probability. For example, uh, we know that 1% uh, of people uh, have uh, cancer each year. And so if you're an insurance company, uh, it's easy to price uh, the, the, the price of insurance against cancer because there is a known probability. Now, uncertainty, it's when you don't know the probability. For example, what is the probability that there is a, a solar uh, flare uh, with a, um, solar eruption with uh, dramatic consequences on the electricity network. We don't really know. We are we're not able to, to attach a probability to that. And this is uh, another problem than uh, decision under risk. And Anscombe and Aumann um, proposed a model on how to make decision in, in these cases. Uh, in another paper, Aumann also showed at, under which condition people can agree to disagree. So what do we mean by that? Um, so he is in the in a Bayesian setting. So Bayesianism um, is a way of uh, inferring knowledge, information from prior information. So prior information is some kind of prejudice, uh, some uh, rough idea you have over the probabilities uh, that different events can occur, but you have no evidence uh, to, to sustain these uh, this prior probabilities, just uh, your best guess. And then you obtain some information, and using this information, you update the probability you, you believe the event will occur, and the new probability is called the posterior belief. I can show you the equations if, if you want. And um, what Aumann shows, and, and yeah, Bayesianism is, is, has been shown to be uh, probably the best uh, way to, to run like inference and, uh, and to integrate new information to learn, basically. And uh, Aumann showed that uh, when people are Bayesian, so they update, they integrate new information following this process, they share the same prior. So, uh, when they are born, when they, when they start thinking of a problem, they, they start at the same uh, um, position. And they have common knowledge of their posterior. So each of them receive private information. So they update their prior uh, using this information. And they reach a new conclusion, a new belief about the world. And they, they, they communicate with the other this new belief, and so the, the, which is called the posterior, and this posterior is common knowledge, meaning that uh, both know uh, the belief of the other, and both know that the other know the belief, and both know that the other know that the other know the belief, etc. When you have these three uh, assumptions, 
then uh, Auman showed that people should have the same posterior belief. So people cannot agree to disagree. And uh, this opened a big literature because it shows that when people agree to disagree, for example, uh, on the political preferences, you know, we can agree uh, not, to, to, not to, to agree on the, the choice of a prime minister, even though we have the same interest, we have like uh, in the same situation. It means that either people are not Bayesian, they don't follow Bayesian rationality, Either they did not share the same prior, the, the same position at the start, or there isn't common knowledge. There, there is a lack of communication between people. Okay, we'll take the pause right now, unless there is some question. Okay, so now we're uh, tackling the sequential games. Um, so again, there are new solution concepts that are appropriate. Um, so let's uh, start with this ultimatum game. So this is the way we represent sequential games. It's another way to, to represent them. It's called extensive form rather than matrix form. So in this ultimatum game, there are two players. One player is, uh, let's call uh, her the the planner, uh, and so she chooses how to split uh, a prize, a prize of 10 francs, and so others, she splits it in a fair way, so 5 francs for her, 5 francs for the receiver, or she split it in an unfair way, 9 francs for her and 1 franc for the receiver. And then the receiver can either accept the deal or reject it, in which case no player gets, uh, gets no, every player gets zero. So uh, if, uh, say, the, the sender, uh, the, the planner proposed the unfair deal and uh, the receiver rejects it, they both get zero. If uh, the receiver accepts it, uh, he gets nine and she gets one. Uh, so, the receiver gets one, the, the planner gets nine. Okay, so what do you play in this game? Um, so we go back to the, to the URL, Slido. So say you are the planner, you propose a fair split or an unfair split? So unfair split, uh, you have chances to get nine instead of five, but maybe uh, the other one will more uh, will be more likely to reject. So what do you play? Okay, let's check. Okay, so most people play the fair deal. And according to game theorists, we are not rational. Because we should have played the unfair split. Why? Let's reason by backward induction. And we assume here that the players are rational and they maximize their payoff. Okay? So if, okay, uh, no, first, first I will ask you the, the second question. The second question is um, with another URL, it's slide.do uh, slash 556 557. And uh, yeah, sorry, you can refresh the page because, yeah. So, so now, Imagine that the, um, the planner has proposed the unfair split. Do you accept it, in which case you get one, she gets nine, or reject it and both get zero? Everyone has answered. Ah, it's half-half. Uh, okay, so, um, 
it means that uh, yeah, that some of you think that the other will not play like they are playing. Um, but again, half of uh, half of us are irrational. Because why would we accept? Why would we reject uh, where we can have a payoff of one if we accept instead of zero? So a rational player will accept everything that is above zero. They will accept. And given that uh, the receiver, the rational receiver, will always accept, then the rational planner should always uh, propose the unfair deal because then she gets the maximum. This uh, notion that we've just uh, described is called the subgame perfect equilibrium. And it refines Nash equilibrium for sequential games. So uh, the definition is that a profile is a subgame perfect equilibrium if it is a Nash equilibrium in every subgame. So uh, in the subgame, the, the second uh, turn, second period, there is, a, there is one player, and uh, the Nash equilibrium is uh, to accept. And, um, and, uh, and in the, the, the first period, then uh, given that uh, the, the, the other will accept, the Nash equilibrium for the, the first player is to propose the unfair split. So it is a refinement of Nash equilibrium in the sense that there are more Nash equilibria than subgame perfect equilibria. And each subgame perfect equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium. Here we can find other Nash equilibrium that are not subgame perfect. Imagine the Nash equilibrium that goes the following way. If you are the receiver, you will accept the split only if it is fair. And if you are the sender, you propose the fair split. If you are the sender, you have no interest to deviate, because if you deviate, the receiver will reject your offer, so you will get zero instead of five. If you are the receiver, you have no interest to deviate, because um, if you deviate and say you accept every offer, then the sender uh, will, uh, I, mean, I mean, you cannot improve by deviating. And, uh, and, and actually, if you would deviate, uh, if you would reject uh, the offer in, in case of a uh, fair deal, you would lose five. And, um, and uh, if you deviate, if you change your, your strategy in case of an unfair deal, it doesn't change anything because uh, the, the, the sender, she will play the, the fair in any case. Okay? The thing is that this Nash equilibrium is not credible because you cannot commit to this strategy. Because once the sender has played, then you enter into a sub-game. It's kind of a new game. And uh, you cannot uh, reason anymore uh, by, by saying, I would uh, uh, do that only if uh, they had not played. Like, uh, if uh, the other had, had proposed the, the unfair, uh, it would uh, be weird, uh, it would be irrational to uh, reject it. So uh, the Nash equilibrium uh, is not credible. And uh, this is the reason why uh, Reinhard Selten introduced the notion of subgame perfect equilibrium. So in general, the, uh, in, there are several Nash equilibria. In the coordination game, we've seen there are two Nash equilibria. And game theorists propose refinement of, uh, of solution concept that refine Nash equilibrium to understand what a uh, player will play uh, because in the end, they will play only one thing. So to decide between the different Nash equilibrium, they propose uh, some solution concepts that are more pre precise that we call uh, refinements. And correlated equilibrium, it was the contrary of a refinement because uh, it's a generalization. And indeed, um, uh, we have that uh, Nash equilibrium is a refinement of correlated equilibrium. 
Okay. So uh, we found the subgame perfect equilibrium by backward induction. And Selten proved that uh, a subgame perfect equilibrium uh, always exists. There are some conditions, but uh, they are generally respected. And um, as we've seen with the example, uh, with us playing, people often do not play the subgame perfect equilibrium. And uh, this was also uh, something that uh, Reinhard Selten investigated. Mm. Now, he also proposed a refinement of Nash equilibrium for a simultaneous game. So here, with the coordination game, he proposed a refinement which is called the trembling hand perfect equilibrium. And there is only one trembling hand uh, perfect equilibrium. It's BRBR. -BR. And uh, so it's the, the purpose of a refinement uh, to explain uh, what player will choose when Nash equilibrium would uh, be too vague. So what is the trembling hand perfect equilibrium? It's, it accounts for the fact that people are not perfectly rational and sometimes they make mistakes. They deviate from perfect rationality, as we've seen with the example of uh, the subgame sub perfect equilibrium that people do not always play. So the idea is that, um, take the example of the, the equilibrium of both uh, player choose T. Maybe they will make some mistake. And so with a very small probability, the other player will order beer instead of tea. Okay? In this case, notice that if, if you are sure that the other player will uh, choose tea, which is the case in the Nash equilibrium, then you are indifferent between uh, tea or beer. Tea or beer. Uh, both uh, gives you two. But now, if there is a small probability that uh, the other player will play beer, then you prefer to play beer. Because if they play tea, you are indifferent. But in the unlikely case where they play beer, you prefer to have beer as well. So the way trembling hand perfect equilibrium is defined is the following. We call a perturbed game a game where every action is played with strictly positive probability, epsilon, at least epsilon. So in this case, uh, TT would not be possible. It would be uh, uh, epsilon for beer, wine minus epsilon for T. And uh, in this perturbed game, uh, we see that the only Nash equilibrium is beer, beer. And we say that the original game is uh, the, the strategy profile in the original game is trembling hand perfect if there is a sequence of perturbed games that converges to the base to the original game in which a series of Nash equilibrium converges to this strategy profile. So it's just a, a way to formalize mathematically the intuition that uh, I just gave. Is there any question? Okay. And um, Selten didn't only uh, contribute to the theory, he was also very uh, important in uh, developing empirical work and developing the field of experimental economics, where uh, it's basically researchers that uh, bring their students or bring uh, whoever uh, is voluntary to the lab and uh, make them play some games, just as what we've done today. And uh, they observe how people play, and this helps testing the theories and understanding how human people behave. And uh, with this empirical work, uh, Selten uh, pro provided evidence that people have bounded rationality. They are not perfectly rational or at least not in the sense that is uh, commonly accepted by economists. And this is actually 
some, this raises some difficulty for game theorists because in game theory, we, the, the theorists always assume that uh, people behave in a rational way to maximize their payoff, uh, do not make mistakes, and so on. Uh, but if this theory uh, is, is not helpful to, to explain how people behave, um, it's much less uh, useful than that we could hope for. So the theory is still um, useful in cases where we know for sure that people are rational. Uh, in general, it may be not people, but uh, companies or like uh, people acting in a very specific uh, situation where the theory applies. And otherwise, it opens a uh, lot of questions on uh, how people behave, how we can model uh, the, the, the strategies they will follow. Any question? Okay. So, um, another Nobel Prize, Thomas Schelling. Um, was awarded not for a contribution to the theory, but uh, rather for um, make bridging the theory and the general audience. So Thomas Schelling had uh, new ideas, new concepts, but uh, uh, they were not necessarily formalized in a mathematical way. Uh, rather, Thomas Schelling wrote uh, books uh, that, that, was, that were uh, uh, largely successful, like The Strategy of Conflict, where he used game theory to analyze the uh, problem of the world, like diplomatic issues, uh, war and peace, um, military uh, strategy, etc. So, um, He's very methodical in the way he proposes to uh, view a problem and solve a problem. And uh, the, the starting point is uh, what is our goal? So the, the goal should be clearly uh, defined. And, and then uh, what is the best strategy to achieve the goal? And uh, he insists on his book, which is about uh, the military strategy that uh, cooperation may often be uh, the, the best strategy to achieve the goal than war. Then he conceptualized uh, other strategies like uh, brickmanship. Brickmanship is the ex escalation of uh, a threat to obtain concessions. Um, Donald Trump could be a good example of uh, brickmanship because he always uh, like uh, threatened uh, by by Twitter, uh, which uh, which uh, may the other uh, country afraid and and accept uh, uh, whatever he wants. But in the strategy of conflict, uh, it was used to describe the Cold War. Because uh, in the Cold War, there was an arms race, which is a brickmanship. So the idea is that uh, you want to, I mean, each uh, um, block wanted to show to the other block that they were ready to go to war, to go to, to complete uh, destruction, uh, to obtain some, uh, some concession, to achieve their goal more easily. And the issue with uh, brickmanship is that uh, the situation can easily run out of control of any of the player uh, because indeed they have to be credible when they threaten the other one to escalate. And, and sometimes they have to, to prove that uh, they, are, uh, they are ready uh, to escalate and to, to incur some cost uh, to be credible. And the, the, the best example is the Cuban uh, missile crisis in 62 where uh, the U.S. threatened uh, the USSR uh, of a nuclear attack if the USSR delivered the nuclear missiles uh, to Cuba. And, uh, and indeed, the USSR freaked out 
at the beginning it's escalated, but in the end they freaked out and they they, they called each other um, and uh, and they say, okay, uh, we are going to to remove the missiles from Cuba and in exchange uh, remove the missiles from uh, from Turkey, I think, or something, or um, and um, or you say that you will remove them. So so they they, uh, they arrived uh, they. they they avoided the escalation and the nuclear war, but people were very afraid. Um, Thomas Schelling also introduced the concept of focal points. Uh, it's actions on which players naturally coordinate. So in the case you have multiple equilibria, which one will be chosen? When, when every equilibria is equally good? Well, with the notion of focal point, we can have an idea. Here again, we, we can go uh, back to the website and I uh, give an example of a focal point where, oh, no, it's not, uh, where, okay, I think I didn't, uh, maybe I forgot to put it. Um, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't put it. Uh, actually, yeah. Actually, I can create it uh, right now. Um, no, oh, I know. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. I know it's this one. Um, Okay, yeah, it's this one. So the the, um, the URL is uh, slide.do slash 556-555. And um, the, the game is the following. You are uh, at the board of uh, a fundraiser, like, uh, um, I don't know, the foundation. But you, you, you don't want to be here, uh, you just want to, to go uh, on your leisure time with your family, whatever. So you want to, to reach the decision the fastest possible. And the decision it's, uh, is uh, how, uh, where should we, uh, to, to which NGO should we give the money this year? NGO uh, called A or NGO called B? Okay. And... Um, and everyone in the room is like you, they don't really have a preference, they just want to, uh, to go back home. And uh, the question is, uh, what chair should go to A? And you have to, to vote in a secret uh, ballots for some reason. Yeah. So what, what do you vote? And the thing is, if you vote the same thing, if everyone agrees, then the uh, decision is taken, everyone can go home. If you disagree, then you have to discuss for hours, so, uh, so it will, you will lose. So, so you have to split uh, some of money, what share should go to A. Has everyone played? Let's see if, uh, exactly, so most people choose 50%. Although there is no uh, mathematical reason to prefer 50%. Mathematically, all choices are equally valid. And mathematically, there are as many Nash equilibria as the number of answers. There is a Nash equilibria that, that equilibrium that everyone chooses 50%, the Nash equilibrium that everyone chooses 0%, etc. But 50% appear to be the focal point because most people choose 50% when, uh, even when they didn't coordinate beforehand. Okay, for some reason, many people also answered 25%, I'm quite surprised, but uh, 50 was still the, the focal point. So Schelling um, continued to analyze uh, military strategy in arms and influence, and there he argued that nuclear weapons should be uh, thought of, thought as deterrent weapons. So nuclear weapons should not be used. Uh, they should only be a threat, credible threat, 
to prevent wars, basically. And this is, how, this is the strategy that is now uh, widely adopted throughout the world. Uh, and, uh, and this book was um, helpful in, uh, in spreading this, uh, this idea because uh, before this book, uh, many people uh, had in mind that we could use a nuclear weapon in a, in a war. So we could think that this book uh, helps uh, avoiding uh, lots of, of death. Uh, the, the argument was that uh, it's better to, to, have, uh, to, to prevent war altogether. What we want is peace. And uh, it's a good way to say that if you are under attack, you will respond by a nuclear, uh, a nuclear launch, nuclear bomb. Uh, but you will not uh, launch a, a war and nuclear bomb by yourself. And, uh, and actually, this, uh, this book uh, on deterrence uh, inspired Stanley Kubrick uh, in doing uh, Dr. Strangelove. And actually, Kubrick uh, had a, a conversation with Thomas Schelling that uh, inspired him the movie. Now, Thomas Schelling also contributed to uh, behavioral economics by highlighting internalities. So internalities is the kind of the same concept of externalities, but instead of your decision having an influence on uh, the other people's utilities, your influence, your decision has an, inf an effect on your future self um, utilities. And uh, uh, Schelling showed that there is kind of conflict between uh, our present self and our future selves. Uh, we don't take uh, time consistent decisions. We favor the present too much, uh, causing internalities. Um, and this explains uh, addictions, alcoholism, uh, uh, smoking, etc., because uh, people uh, outweigh the, the pleasure, the instantaneous pleasure, and forget about the long-term consequences. Uh, so he coined the, the term economics, uh, when the, the self finds strategies to cope with internalities, like pre-commitment. So pre-commitment, uh, the good example is uh, Ulysses uh, and his mast. So you know when uh, Ulysses uh, is uh, on his boat and there is uh, the, the wonderful uh, song of the, the sirene, sirene and uh, every human uh, would, uh, would crave to, to go to the island and, and die on the island uh, because the, the music is so beautiful. So they all put uh, earplugs but, uh, but Ulysses, he, he wants to still hear the siren, so he has to be attached to, to the mast to, to be able to hear it. And um, this is a pre-commitment. So uh, another possibility, I don't know, it's like uh, you, would, uh, you would unsubscribe from your internet connection uh, one month before the exam, so you are sure you will not go uh, on Instagram or Facebook for one month before the exam. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, some people do that, like they, they make their future self incur a cost uh, to avoid a greater cost because they know that their future self wouldn't be able to resist uh, the temptation and do the right thing. Uh, the, the technical way to model it is uh, through hyperbolic di discounting, if you're interested, but uh, yeah, I'm not explaining this. And uh, Schelling also worked on other topics like uh, climate change. So he, he showed uh, that climate change is a bargaining between countries or between uh, actors. Um, and that uh, this is the, the good way to uh, approach the problem. That uh, if, uh, if uh, for example, India, until recently, uh, did not want uh, to, to fight climate change. Uh, it's because uh, they found it illegitimate uh, to, to fight climate change uh, if they have to pay for it, because they are not responsible for it. 
And so uh, they, they want the rich countries to, to, to pay for the extra cost of decarbonizing their industry. And the rich countries uh, are selfish, do not want to pay for uh, India or, or Africa. And uh, this is this uh, issue of bargaining where, where each country tries to, to maximize uh, what they can get out of it that creates the, the problem. Um, he also uh, showed in a very popular model uh, that segregation can easily emerge. So in his model, you have like uh, people are uh, uh, located on a, a plane, like a, a map, if you want. And uh, let's say they are like uh, black and white and uh, each uh, ethnicity has a slight preference of uh, like, uh, if you are a, a black, you don't want to be the only black in a white neighborhood and vice versa. Uh, so you want to have uh, at least uh, 5% uh, or 10% of uh, people of your own color in your neighborhood. And uh, he showed that if you randomly uh, locate the, the people at the beginning of the game, and those who are not happy with their location relocate, then you will end up, or you can end up in a completely segregated map where you have entirely black neighborhood and entirely white neighborhood, although the preference uh, for, uh, for your own color is, is, is slight. So this justifies uh, policies of uh, urban mixing. Um, Okay, let me jump to um, mechanism design. So we have um, until now seen how rational agents should play. Mechanism design is the reverse. Uh, it's reverse game theory. Now we want, uh, we, 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 as a, we design, we want to design the game so that uh, the players play uh, as we expect. So mechanism design is the study uh, of designing games to obtain a desired outcomes, given that we know how the players will play. Formally, a mechanism can be modeled as a game, a game of, uh, of design, mechanism design, with the principal and the agent. So the principal is the one who chooses the rules and in particular chooses the payoff functions, the payoff structure. And the agent, or there can be several agents, I, they hold private information drawn by nature. So there is a distribution of uh, possible uh, information they can have that we call the type. An example of the, the type of an agent that only there is private information, so the agent knows it but not the principal, is uh, their ability to work or their preferences uh, or the quality of the good uh, they are selling, things like that. And in the game, the agent will report their type. So the, the type they will report is theta at, and they will obtain uh, the payoff given by uh, so um, the, the, the payoff uh, when they report uh, type uh, theta hat and the other player also report uh, theta minus i hat, given that they are of type uh, theta. Um, for example, when um, when uh, they, they the, the type uh, is uh, your level in, uh, in, uh, in English or in German, okay, your level in Swiss German, and you apply it to a job uh, in Zurich, uh, you will announce uh, I'm, uh, I'm native uh, in Swiss German, so you report uh, theta hat uh, native speaker, and uh, so then you are hired. And your payoff, it doesn't only depend on uh, being hired. This would be uh, Y of theta hat. Uh, y of theta hat is you're hired when you're native speaker and you're not hired when you're not. It also depends on your true type. 
because uh, if you are not native speaker, you're just a beginner, then it will be much harder uh, at your work uh, to do the job. Okay, uh, now we, agents, uh, yeah, we're interested in mechanisms in which agents are never worse off by revealing their true type, whatever the others do. So theta hat equals theta. In this case, we say that the mechanism is truthful, and there are two synonyms. We say it's strategy proof or dominant strategy incentive compatible. Uh, incentive compatible, it means that uh, you, the incentive is uh, to say the truth. And dominant strategy, it means that uh, it's uh, the best strategy, whatever the other will do. Examples of uh, truthful mechanisms are referendum or second price auction. So in a referendum, uh, your dominant strategy is to play according to your preference. If you want a uh, uh, gay marriage, uh, the, the, the best you can do to obtain gay marriage is to vote yes. Okay? In the second price auction, uh, it's a, an auction where the, the one with the highest, best, the, the higher, the highest bid gets the, the object, uh, but pays the price of the second highest bid, then uh, the dominant strategy is to put uh, your, the value you have for the object. Now, um, Meyerson, uh, so yeah, this, these notions, uh, mechanism design, uh, uh, truthful mechanism, uh, they were uh, defined and uh, put forth by Leonid Urvich. And uh, Meyerson and uh, Maskin, they, 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 they pushed uh, the field one step further and they introduced Bias Nash incentive compatibility. So here, uh, agents uh, have uh, their interest is to reveal their type, but only in expectation. It's not whatever the other will do, but it's given uh, their belief of what the others will do. Their best interest is to reveal their type. And uh, so it's a weaker notion of incentive compatibility. It is the usual notion. It applies to Bayesian games. Um, so I haven't talked about Bayesian equilibrium. It's another solution concept. Uh, it's, the, the, the difference is that uh, players have some beliefs uh, of uh, what the other do. And uh, yeah. And players form rational expectations about the other's types. And the very important result in this literature is the revelation principle. It says that if a mechanism exists that can achieve a desired outcome, okay, here an outcome, it is um, a function from the true types to the payoffs. So uh, the, the mechanism designer, what they want is that, uh, for example, in the example I gave, those, the, the native uh, speakers are hired and uh, the beginners are not hired. This is the desired outcome. And the revelation principle says that if a mechanism exists that achieves the desired outcome in equilibrium, then there exists an incentive compatible mechanism with the same outcome where agents truthfully report their type. So it allows to narrow down uh, the, the, the different mechanisms that uh, the designer uh, looks at to only the subclass of uh, truthful mechanisms where agents say the truth. Because uh, if the, the outcome you desire can be achieved with an incentive compatible mechanism, uh, uh, with a mechanism, then it can be achieved with an incentive compatible mechanism. And uh, yeah, are there some questions? So it's quite abstract. 
And in the next slide, uh, we'll see how this can be uh, applied in the real world. So, uh, Lloyd uh, Chaplet, um, is famous for the study of cooperative games and the Chaplet value, but uh, I, won't talk to, I won't talk about it. And uh, he's also famous for uh, solving an important problem with Gale, which is the stable marriage problem. So it's an economic uh, way of thinking uh, about marriage. You have uh, N men, N women, and uh, each one uh, wants to, to marry uh, one of the opposite sex and uh, and each one has a preference ranking about the others okay and uh, so because we can uh, and I will explain you the problem in a minute but we already know that we can only uh, restrict our attention to truthful mechanism where everyone provides their true ranking of the opposite sex members. And uh, the problem is the following. We want a stable matching, meaning we want to propose a set of couples such that there is no pair who would rather marry each other than their proposed partners. Okay, so uh, imagine, um, uh, Okay, we are almost, uh, I think there are five uh, men, uh, five women in the room, so it's perfect. So let's say I'm the mechanism designer, I, I match you I, I, by, by pair, and uh, it's a stable uh, matching if uh, there is uh, no pair uh, of people that uh, are not within the, the, the proposed couples that, uh, that say, oh, we would have uh, both uh, preferred to be together than with our uh, partner. If there is no such pair, then it is stable. It is a stable matching. And um, they proposed uh, an algorithm that uh, solves uh, this problem. It's the deferred acceptance algorithm. It's truthful and it ensures stable marriages and everyone get ma gets married. It works the following way. Uh, in the first step, in the first uh, stage, each woman asks a man to marry her. So uh, each woman will propose the, the first man on her list, uh, and the proposed men, there will be, uh, if n equals five, there will be at, at most uh, five uh, proposed men, but maybe less, maybe all the women will propose the same guy. Uh, proposed men answer either maybe or no. They answer maybe to uh, one woman, their preferred women among those who proposed, and no to the others. And the process is repeated among uh, so unengaged women, so the women who didn't get an answer maybe, uh, they propose uh, other men, uh, so they, they propose the second man on the list, and uh, if the second man doesn't say maybe, then uh, they propose the third, etc. Yes? Just a quick question, so this, is, this implies that the men um, get all the proposals simultaneously, right, and then decide? Yes. Because they need to know sort of who proposes to them in order to decide whether... Yes, so, so, there, is, so in the first, it's, it's, uh, there are several stages. So in the first stages, uh, all women, all women uh, propose to one man, and, uh, and men receive uh, all the proposals simultaneously. In the second stage, uh, there is a new proposal that are coming up. But imagine you are a, a man, and uh, in, the, in the first stage, uh, there is your, your second choice who proposed you. You said maybe, and uh, and your first choice, uh, she proposed a friend of you who, who said no to her. And in the second run, uh, your first choice, she 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 goes to you and she say she proposes you. 
Then you say maybe to her, or you can even say yes directly. Uh, and you change your answer to the one you said maybe in the first round. You say no to her. Okay. And so she, uh, although she didn't participate in the second run, because she had a maybe, she will participate in the third run, because now she doesn't have, uh, she's not engaged anymore. Okay, and uh, they prove that uh, after uh, N rounds, everyone is married, and the marriage are stable. And, uh, and it is truthful, like people have uh, the, serve best their interest by, by uh, listing their true rankings. And uh, the thing is that there are different uh, possible stable uh, matchings. In particular, we could have uh, said that the men propose and the women uh, respond. It would have uh, also um, resulted in a stable marriage where everyone gets married, but another one. And actually, the matching is the best for all of the sex who proposes. So in my example, it's best for women. Uh, for every woman, there cannot be uh, a, best, a better outcome that is stable uh, than uh, the one given through this algorithm. And, uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, there is a related uh, problem, which is the stable roommate problem. So it's the same problem where everyone is bisexual, uh, or everyone looks for a roommate. Okay? Um, and, um, and Alvin Roth uh, studied uh, the, these more uh, complex problems. Um, an extension of the stable roommate problem is uh, the college admissions problem, where here uh, you have uh, students who apply to colleges and uh, colleges who uh, have preferences over the potential students. And the difference is that uh, each college accepts several students as a given uh, size, a uh, given number of students they will accept. And uh, so Roth uh, developed the solution in the 80s. Uh, and uh, even in the complex cases where uh, there are couples, so uh, so you have like a husband and a wife, uh, they both look for a, a college and, uh, or for a hospital, for doctors, uh, and um, their preferences are correlated. It depends on what the other gets. And, uh, and Roth uh, also provided uh, an algorithm in these cases. And so uh, these systems are used in practice. Uh, for college admissions in a number of countries, for hospitals to, to, to know uh, who doctors get uh, where in a country. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, the, the algorithm that, um, that are used have been developed by uh, Alvin Roth, uh, the Nobel Prize. Thank you.